kingdoms and empires first let's talk about the gupta empire so this gupta empire kept the northern india politically united for more than 200 years from the ad 320 to from the ad up to the ad 540 so there are number of achievements which goes for the credit of gupta empires what are such achievements they are art literature and science so in this image students you see the gupta empire in the northern part of the india let's see about the sources which give us an information about this gupta empire so actually there are several sources which narrate the story of the gupta empire first let's talk about the literary sources that is book written sources so plays as well as travelogues gave us a portrayal of this period and there was a chinese buddhist traveler named fa hi he has written many books in his writings we come to know about the social and religious conditions of india during the gupta empire there are also inscriptions inscriptions are a great wealth belonging to the gupta period and in variety of places they tell us about the achievement of the ruler and one most popular inscription is Hari Sena's inscription praising the Gupta king named Samudra Gupta. So he, this image tell, tells us how Samudra Gupta used. To. So there are also seals and coins belonging to this period, which give us a glimpse in the age of the Guptas. So how were the coins belonging to the Guptas period? They were gold coins, they were bronze coins, and different figures were engraved on it. So this image we see, these coins belong to the Gupta period. how were the arts and monuments during the gupta period so there were many masterpieces in the art and the notable one was a beautiful image of the buddha at the mathura region so in this image we see the gupta art different figures of the buddha and this is a pillar and these are the arts and monuments of the gupta period let's see about a gupta king known as chandra he ruled from a period of ad 3320 to AD 335 so chandragupta 1 he was a king of india from 320 to 330 ce and he was the founder of imperial gupta dynasty so gupta dynasty also was a very big empire and shri gupta he was the first known ruler and he was the grandfather of the chandragupta and chandragupta's life is actually unknown we don't have much information about him and he was just a local chief of a kingdom of magadha so this kingdom of magadha was in a modern day so modern day bihar state was known as the kingdom of magadha in the past and he married a lichavi princess from nepal and then he cemented his position so this chandragupta one ruler he laid a strong foundation for the kingdom and then after his death The kingdom was succeeded by his son known as Samudra Gupta. So this is an image of the Chandra Gupta ruler. Chandra Gupta he was the ruler of the Gupta Empire and he was the successor of Chandra Gupta I. And this person was a great military genius in the Indian history and he was the third ruler of the Gupta dynasty and his rule ushered in the golden age of India when all the weapons were made up of gold. So this Samudra Gupta conquered and occupied vast territories of India including present day Delhi western Uttar Pradesh Nepal Assam as well as the Bengal so he had an aggressive expansionist policy and he had success from the Allahabad pillar inscription so not only India some parts of the Punjab as well as the Afghanistan came under his rule So he was not only a great conqueror but also an accomplished veena player as well as a poet. So this is a gold coin of the Samudra Gupta period in which his image is inscripted in armor. Next comes Chandra Gupta 2. So he was also known as Chandra Gupta Vikramaditya was and he was a most powerful emperor of the total Gupta empire in the northern Indian region. His influence extended up to Vakataka kingdom in the south also. He also conquered Saka kingdom and made Ujjain his second capital. And not only Saka kingdom, he also occupied the Malwa and the Kathiawar regions. So till date we have Kutub Minar in Delhi, right? So all the inscriptions on those Kutub Minar are believed to refer to Chandragupta II period. And the great poet Kalidasa also uh, was also a part of this Chandragupta emperor. So this is a gold coin showing Chandragupta II. 
ஆல்சோ நோன் ஆஸ் விக்ரமாதித்யா அண்ட் திஸ் இஸ் காளிதாச த கிரேட் போயட் பார்ட் ஆஃப் த கோர்ட் ஆஃப் சந்திரகுப்தா டூ குமாரகுப்தா he ruled from the AD 415 to AD 454 he succeeded chandragupta ii he ruled for 40 years and he was a powerful king so during his ruling period he retained and defended the vast empire which he had inherited from chandragupta ii then kumaragupta was followed by skandagupta this is an image showing gold coin of kumaragupta So let's see about the life under the Gupta rulers. So how was the life of the common people? The administration part. So unlike the Mauryan people where the king held all the powers, these Gupta's were more of decentralized and they divided the kingdom into number of provinces and these provinces were ruled by governors. Again these provinces were divided into districts, towns and villages. The bigger cities were administered by ayuktas. These ayuktas were appointed by the governor and they were assisted by town clerks and a lot of tax divided on the people one fourth to one sixth of the land revenue was taxed and high ranking officials first they were paid salaries in the form of cash but later the land grants replaced the cash payments of the society so the chinese buddhist traveler wrote many books right fahin in his books we came to know about the simple life which was led by the people of the villages but in the towns and the cities the rich people enjoyed a better lifestyle the caste system also came up and it was so de- it made a deep inroads into the society untouchability was also practiced so the chinese buddhist traveler fahin he described about the cruel treatment which was given to the chandalas who were chandalas they were the people who cremated the dead and because they used to cremate the dead they were considered untouchable by the hindus so these chandalas were compelled to stay on the outskirts of the villages this is the image of fahin the chinese buddhist traveler talking about the trade so during the gupta empire there was a long distance trade with many countries of eastern roman empire west asia africa and also southeast asia and they were trade mostly was through seas and oceans so the port city such as bharuch and kambe on the western side they prospered a lot this prosperities of the guptas would be definitely attributed to the rich business trade and these contacts led we they made through this trade they left a long lasting impact on the culture of the southeast asian people and then what impact they left they spread different religions from india to different parts of the world sanskrit was spread buddhism was spread and as well as hinduism was also spread how was the religion during the gupta empire so religion gained importance all the rulers were hindus they were tolerant towards others faiths so a great big change took place both in hinduism as well as buddhism idols of gods and goddesses were made and established in the temples and they were prayed in the temples kumara gupta mahendra ditya he found the most famous buddhist center at the nalanda university so these gupta rule lasted for a one and half century and during the end of this period the feudal chief who owned their beginnings to the guptas they assumed the more power so during the end of the gupta empire the, the feudal chiefs attained more power and then there was a dynasty which extended its power into the present day haryana with thanesar as the capital and this thanesar dynasty was ruled by harshvardhana so this was the old age so the gupta period ruled gupta kingdom was ruled over a one and half century and then came thanesar dynasty with harshvardhana king as the ruler so now let's study about harshvardhana so harshvardhana came to power when he was just 16 years old and then he established a mighty empire which spread across many states of northern india what were those states the present uttar pradesh bihar bengal orissa and the east punjab were those states harshvardhan moved his capital to kanauj kanauj replaced pataliputra as the center of the power in india and all the about the harshvardhan this we came to know from the accounts of the pilgrims especially a chinese pilgrim named hyun sang he visited the court of harsha so from his writings 
we came to know about this harshvardhana so they were also writings of the people like mar banabhatta they also lived in the harsha's court and also from the coin from the inscriptions we came to know about the harshvardhana ruler let's talk about the administration during the harshvardhana period not like mauryas not like guptas the people of harshvardhana's administrators of the harshvardhana's empire they were paid in only the land grants and they were never paid in cash so because of this the power and influence of the king was reduced and the king was assisted by a council of ministers and this is the image showing how harshvardhana used to look let's see about the occupation and trade during the harshvardhana period so the huan sang was a chinese pilgrim traveler from his writings we came to know that the agriculture was the main occupation of trade and these trading centers were along the river ganga and this was an internal waterway to transport the goods also so this is a image of a chinese pilgrim huan sang how was the religion harshvardhana is believed to be a follower of the buddhism in his later stage of life and he used to organize religious assemblies once in every 5 years and in these religious assemblies he used to honor the people belonging to all the religions and the fifth buddhist council was held by the harshvardhana in kanauj in the ad 641 how was the art and culture during his period he was a patron of the arts He had famous writers such as Banabatta and Dandin attached to his court. This Banabatta wrote Harsha Charita, which is a great source of information about the rule during the Harsha's period. And this Harsha Vardhana ruler, he himself also has written some plays in the Sanskrit language, such as Ratnavali and Priyadarshika, and educational centers like Kanauj, Vallabhi. Varanasi Nalanda all these were patronized and he gave lot of donations to this Nalanda's learning center the next rulers were Pallavas and Chalukyas so after the end of the Satvahana empire around the 220 AD the several kingdoms arose in the Deccan region that is the mostly south indian region so at that time the most strongest of all the rulers were Chalukyas and Pallavas let's see about the Chalukyas first These Chalukyas ruled over a larger part of the Deccan from the 6th century to the 8th century AD and the captain of their kingdom was Badami of Vatapi and the famous ruler of this Chalukya dynasty was Pulakesan II and under his rule the kingdom spread from the Narmada to the Kaveri region covering the Karnataka and the Andhra Pradesh So this Pulakesan II he defeated the Harshvardhana ruler at the banks of the Narmada in a battle. So the Chalukyas were also involved in many battles with the Pallavas. So Pulakesan also de- defeated the Pallava king Mahendra Varma and then the Mahendra Varma's son Narsimha Varma again defeated the Pulakesan and then he captured back the Badami capital. So this vivid accounts of this Pulakesan's campaigns this provide us and inscriptions composed by his court poet Ravi Kriti in the AD 6634 and this Chalukyas were finally defeated by the Rashtrakutas in the AD 753 and one more beautiful thing to remember about the Chalukya dynasty was is the architecture and art they left behind such as the rock cut temples at the Patadakal Badami Aihol they are their famous monuments their architecture was a mixture of both northern as well as the southern style so this is the bhutanatha temple at the badami and this is the papanatha temple at the patadakkal next came pallavas so their kingdom spread mostly over the southern india and the capital was kanchipuram the great rulers were simha vishnu and narsimha Var- narsimha varma one so this narsimha varma one defeated the chalukyan king pulakesan ii and then they were continuously involved with the chalukyas and then the cholas but these cholas always weakened the pallavas and finally the cholas defeated the pallavas in the ad 1890 so these pallavas also were great builders they built a shore temple on the kasinatha temple at the kanchipuram place and they are known for their rich contribution to the indian architecture this is the shore temple 